Thanks, Steve. Right, is this microphone on? Yeah, all good? Excellent. Let's make sure all the technology is set up here. So, buenos dias. Good morning. It's uh, muy frío in Barcelona today. Um, I was here last week, actually, and it was, I, I left on Thursday, and it was 18 degrees. So it's a very, very big difference. I was doing a speech, and um, this is a pretty big crowd, right? So this is fantastic. Thank you for all coming out today. Uh, but last week I did a speech, and only one person showed up. It's very sad. So she was sitting down front, and I said, right, well, I'll give you a personal speech today because no one else showed up. And she said, that's great, but hurry up because I'm here to clean up the room after you go. So anyway. Anyway, so um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you to Advent for inviting me. Um, also, thank you to um, the Learn Light folks for uh, uh, hosting me at dinner last night, which was fantastic. We had some really good discussions. I'll try to weave some of that in here today. So a very big title, 21st Century People and the Importance of Continuous Learning. There's a lot to cover there. So um, it's such a distinguished group. As I was going through you know, who's attending today, and sort of what, what gives me the right to stand up here and talk about anything uh, regarding uh, HR? Well, we'll find out um, today, but it's a it's very impressive group here today. I mean, as Steve said, my background is 25 years in consulting. So I was a senior partner at Accenture. I, I was there for 16 years, um, helped set up uh, their talent uh, consulting practice. And then I went to IBM and led IBM's uh, global human capital consulting practice, which is where um, I became fascinated meeting CEOs and CHROs about the whole idea of HR analytics. So sadly, I took time and wrote a book uh, with some support from, from two of my colleagues, and it's called Calculating Success. We'll talk about it later. But HR analytics is very, very important. The next book is right now titled 21st Century People, and as Steve said, I'm going to share some of that with you today. It's a fascinating time we're living in, truly. And it keeps getting more fascinating uh, after 2016. So what we're going to do today, what we're going to cover, we're going to kind of start at the 50, so just imagine we're in a plane, 50,000 foot level, and we're going to come in for a landing. Um, and we're going to start very, very high level, which is HR trends. The future is now. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that are coming uh, and are here already. And then I'm going to outline what I think is a really critical situation around people productivity crisis. But I'm going to offer a solution as well. So not just uh, doom and gloom, but how do we fix it? And so what's changing and why? So why, why do we have um, uh, a people productivity crisis at the moment? Well, I'm going to talk about three areas, performance management and how that's changing, how we motivate um, humans is changing. Uh, digital HR, how is that then supporting moving to this um, new form of working? And then we're going to bring it home, right? So we're going to go 50,000 feet, we're going to land the plane. And we're going to bring it all down to learning and continuous learning and what's happening in that space now and why it's important. And hopefully, if we have time, I've got 45 minutes today. Hopefully, if we have time, we'll do a few Q&A. You can get some free consulting. Um, is that okay for everybody? Yeah? Good. So HR trends in the 21st century. Let me ask, I, I like to start with a question to you all. And I think this really illustrates the challenge that we have for those of us in higher learning or for those of us in, um, in senior HR positions. How many of you know, and hold up your hand, how many of you know exactly how many people are in your organization today? Very good number. That's a bit above average, so that looks like about 80%. OK, so those of you who held your hands up, how many of you know exactly how many people you're going to need in 18 months and what skills they're going to require? Ah, not so many hands. And it, it, it's a fundamental issue, right? If you think about it, and when I sp have spent time with CEOs and senior executives, that's the question that they want answered, right? You'd be surprised how many companies, usually when I ask how many of you know how many people you have in your organization, about 30% hold up their hands at best. So this is an above average group, right? And then even less hold up their hands to say, yes, we know how many we're going to need in 18 months. And, and if you're a, a, a senior executive or you are a, an HR practitioner, that is pretty scary. If you don't know where you're going, what, how many people you're going to need, and what types of skills, it's very, very difficult to plan for the future. It's very difficult to capture new markets. It's a fundamental challenge um, in businesses today. And I'm going to outline some of the things and, and ways that we can solve that today. But I think that illustrates uh, the, the kind of core challenge. 
So it's, it's time to rethink the future of the workforce. Well, we said that in the year 2000, and we're still saying it here in 2017. But it is a little bit different from 15 years ago when the, when the internet was really coming to the fore. If you think about it today, 93% of software in the world that's offered up is cloud, is, is cloud technology. Does everybody know what cloud is? So it's really simple. If you use LinkedIn or, or Facebook, whatever, you're using cloud uh, applications, right? It's application-based, internet-based, very easy to access. So 93% of the new software offerings coming out are in the cloud. Now, the interesting thing, uh, the cloud is a misnomer, right? It is, it's not named properly. So at SAP, we have a tool which many of you might know, SuccessFactors. It's an HR cloud platform. Um, and it's very much not in the cloud. In fact, if you go to our headquarters in Waldorf, Germany, you will see a very large building surrounded with razor wire and very tall uh, fences and guards, right? It's all on the ground. It's very much terra firma. It's not in the cloud. So when people say cloud, just keep that in mind. It is literally out there. It's a bit of a misnomer. We have over a billion social network users. It's amazing when you think about that. And then you think inside our organizations, are we leveraging that power? 15 billion web-enabled mobile devices, data doubling every 18 months, 50 billion devices connected to the internet. My wife has a refrigerator that she ordered that's smarter than me, right? So when we run out of milk, it knows and it orders it for us. If we run out of butter, it knows and orders it for us. It's amazing, right? So I could never remember to do that and I wouldn't know how to order it either. So, so we have a refrigerator and that refrigerator is always connected. It's always online. It's thinking, it's, it's learning about the types of food and, and groceries we have as we go on. It's really quite an amazing thing. I still can't figure out how to use it, but it's pretty magical. So if you think about that, that's kind of the world we live in, but does work look like that? Is work smart like that? Is work connected like that? Back to the point that I made a moment ago, we don't even know how many people we're going to need in our organizations in 18 months, let alone have uh, devices connected inside of our organizations. So the future is here, and I think we need to get ready. So you're probably wondering what this device is. Does anybody know what this is? Raise your hand if you know. A few people, a couple, okay. This is my digital assistant. So she sits in my office at home, my home office, and helps me throughout the day with various things. So let me wake her up and see if she's, um, if she's here. Alexa. Oh, no, she's saying no, she's not connected. Alexa. I'm having trouble understanding right now. Oh, no. She's not connected. We might have to come back to her later. Alexa. Oh, no. She's lost connection. So what? I'm having trouble understanding right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thanks, Alexa. <laughs> anyway, it's sort, of, it's sort of like my wife. She says that as well. I'm having trouble listening at the moment. Anyway, um, she sits in my office, and if she was actually working, and I'm not sure why she's not. She's lost connection to the Internet. She would greet me this morning. She would tell me my schedule, right? And then I could ask her questions like, oh, I'm, I'm really interested in what's dark matter. And she would explain it to me. She would say, dark matter is, and she would read it all out in a very natural language um, sort of way, in, unlike in the way she's not working at the moment. Maybe we can get her working a little bit later. But the future is here. And, and this is profound when we think about um, learning, when we think about um, work. So if you have one of these at your desk at work, you can literally ask her, tell me about talent management, and she'll tell you the very latest on talent management, or tell you the very latest on... And, and at home, in my office, sometimes she comes on and says, ooh, we've got a special at Amazon, would you like to buy this thing? So a little bit of sales going on there, but, um, um, but the future is here. So if she were working, which she normally does, um, she would be able to tell a lot of these things. So this is always connected. Um, it has natural language um, discussions, so, and she learns what I like and what I do and those sorts of things. It's a very, very powerful um, way to, uh, to start to work. But if you think about it, we've got these at home, but we don't have these at work, do we? Very interesting that, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. So Alexa, thanks. She's still not there now. Alexa, are you there? No? No, she's given up. Right, so let's talk about sort of eight um, major trends that, um, that I sort of see. And of course, there's tons more out there, but these are just the ones that when I started to look at some of the challenges um, for companies and for organizations, these are the ones that I see over and over and over again that are happening uh, at the moment. So the first one, drive, and I'll spend some time on some of these, but I'm just going to go through high level now.
Drive. How many people have read Daniel Pink's book, Drive? Quite a few of you. I, for, me, it's been, for me, it's one of the most fundamental um, uh, human capital books of the past five or eight years. Very, very important. Essentially, he, ha he uh, outlines um, that the way we try to motivate people, which is very 18th century, 17th century, doesn't work today. And I'll come back to that. But essentially, he's saying it doesn't work. Paying people bonuses to try to motivate them actually creates complete opposite behavior. And we'll look at that a little bit more. So this is a major one. How we motivate people in the 21st century is changing dramatically. The next one, emerging workforce, six generations in work at once. So if you think about it, we've got 16-year-olds, and we also have 60 and 70-year-olds. Does anybody want to take a guess as to why that is? Why, why in 2020 are we going to have um, six different generations in work at once? It's the elongation of lifespan, right? So this is a and then a lot of it is not, um, uh, is not really that understood and is not being planned for in organizations. So we think about it. When my grandparents were my age at about 52, I'm 52 years old, um, they had to retire. They were too ill to work. Luckily, they had a nice pension from the factories they were working in, the car factories, but they couldn't, they couldn't work. Um, and so lived another 20 years, had a great uh, retirement. But today, what we're seeing is that people get to their 70s, and they are very, very fit, very mentally with it, and want to work. And in fact, in a lot of cases, have to work, right? Um, because retirement is a lot more expensive than it was in the past. Companies don't provide pensions. So we're going to have, and we are having the situation where we've got 16-year-olds through to 60, 70-year-olds in work. And this is the first time in human history this has happened. It's, it's very profound in terms of productivity, and, and, but more importantly, how inside organizations, both um, uh, higher learning organizations and also in companies, dealing with this, because these six generations learn very differently, right? People like me, baby boomer, who learned how to learn by sitting in a classroom and being very passive and just waiting for people to tell me stuff like I'm doing here today. That's how we learned. But the, the newer generation doesn't work that way, doesn't learn, and we'll come back and look at that. The next one is employer brand loyalty, so the war for talent. It's, it's kind of not what we think. In the year 2000, it was a scarcity. Oh my God, we're, everybody's going to retire and we're not going to have any talent. Well, back to point number two, we actually have a surplus of talent. The war for talent, right, is a surplus of talent. And so therefore, creating brand loyalty to your higher education, university, or your private or government entity Creating a brand loyalty is really important because in order to get a hold of that best talent and that surplus, you want to draw people to you. And in fact, if you go to an Apple store, the people obviously there, they are so excited to work there. They would probably work for free. That's how strong Apple's brand loyalty is. They would probably work for free. Good thing Apple doesn't do that to them, but it, that's how strong it can get. And you know, companies and organizations have shown that it, the stronger your brand loyalty, the more engaged workforce you have. So this is emerging as a major, uh, a major uh, issue for the future. The next one is machines take over. Um, so you've probably heard this and seen this. There's a lot of this in the, uh, uh, in the press at the moment. But I'm going to tell you in a little while why, uh, why that's really not a, a bad thing at all, why, in fact, it's actually um, very beneficial. So th the fact is, is that machines, you know, how, how much smarter they become, right? There's lots of things that they can't do that humans can do, so we'll come back to that. People insight. So, as I said earlier, sadly, I spent a year writing this book on HR analytics, but it is so important. There's no way that you can address a lot of these issues, these trends that are coming, if you don't understand the basic data about your workforce. As we illustrated here, vast majority in here, nobody can really say, very few can say how many people we're going to need in 18 months and what skills. This is fundamental. That's not for me, by the way. Um, so people insights, I'll come back to this as well. Really, really important. The next one, Facebookization of work. I, I was astounded in the past four or five years when you meet with a CEO and you ask them, what, what is it that you think you really want to do in terms of connecting with your people and to get your people on your agenda and driving and execution. And you see, I see this word come up all the time. I want to Facebook eyes my company. I want the experience of employees to be the same as when they're at home, right? 
There are, it, it's easy, it's intuitive, it's always on, it's always there, it's supporting, right? It's supporting productivity, it's supporting the ability to, um, uh, to build productivity. So Facebookization of work. Digital at home, well shouldn't we be digital at work? The next one, and we're gonna spend, we're gonna spend the most time on this one, so the human productivity crisis. Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding yes, we, yes, we know, Alexa, you told us earlier, so thank you. <laughs> she's, gonna get, um, uh, she's gonna get a pay cut after this. So. So we'll spend time on that in a moment. Uh, social learning, and then this is where we're gonna land the plane at the end. You know, what is changing in learning? And it is this whole aspect of social learning, and I'm gonna explain that in a little bit more detail and how that works. So these are a lot of the emerging trends, and so let's explore some of these in a little bit more detail. So the people productivity uh, crisis. So 18 months ago, the OECD, does everybody know the OECD is? It's essentially the world's economic body, did an extensive study um, to try to figure out um, what we can expect in terms of GDP growth and GDP per capita growth going forward. And they've taken a very pessimistic view. So going out to 2060, this is what the curve looks like. So the average annual rate of GDP growth is set to decline steadily over the next 50 years. So the average rate is going to come down. And this is the first time really, because this goes from 2000 out to 2060, if you go back to 1945, up to 2000, all of those graphs are going like this. So in living memory, for most of us, we do not remember a time where GDP is not growing. We don't remember a time where people productivity is not growing. We don't, we don't really remember a time when the standard of living wasn't going up. Well, this is what's happening. So we're gonna see the average annual rate go down. And the reason the main reason they put, and they put the vast majority of the blame on this particular uh, situation was human productivity. So again, for the first time since the 1940s, starting in about, 20, about 2001, 2002, human productivity has been going down year on year on year, which is really surprising, right? You think about all the fantastic technology we have, all the supposed fantastic new management models we have. Well, it hasn't had an impact. Right? In fact, it's having a negative impact and we're losing productivity. And the reason why this is fundamental and scary is because when GDP per capita, so per person, goes down in an economy, living standards are going down. Which means then you've got wages going down, you have very unhappy people, right? And we've seen this in the US over the past five or six years where wages have been declining and they're now coming back up again. But this is a real issue, right? So this is fundamental going out. We are gonna leave our children a world with lower living standards if this goes on. So the OECD is very, very pessimistic and, and they point to one simple reason as to why human productivity is going down. Companies and governments around 2001 stopped investing in learning and development, leadership, and also investing in marrying up people to technology. So the technology has taken off dramatically in what it does and its intelligence and all those sorts of things. But the investment in getting people aligned with that technology to produce, produce productivity is, has um, gone down. So the 9-11 the terrorist attacks actually were the, the key of that. So once that recession came on, there's never been a recovery in that investment. And this is what the OECD says is the main reason why, he's going, why human productivity is going down. That's the pessimistic view. I actually take a more optimistic view. And the reason why I take an optimistic view is because I'm out with a lot of you and your companies. And being an SAP, we provide Facebook-like software. And I'm not here to sell you software. This isn't about technology. But the fact is, is that there's a combination of people starting to realize that this problem, that we need to invest in people, and invest in the technology and get people aligned with technology. Plus these technologies are coming and becoming more and more clever, more productive. This is, I believe, I'm much more optimistic about it when you combine those two things. So let me explain. So um, I've come up with an equation, quote unquote, called PEIP, right? So this equation is when you put the right people plus right skills plus right place, right time, right motivation, you get people, engagement, innovation, and productivity. Proven. In fact, the OECD points to a, 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 
a, a number of case studies that were done in America from 1992 to about 2000, 2001, where if you remember that period in the US, US GDP was outperforming the rest of the world pretty dramatically. Human productivity in the US was outperforming quite dramatically. And the reason why is because companies and governments were getting very, very good at, at this equation, and they were marrying that up to the new internet technology. So the US, for that period of time until 9-11, uh, 2001, was doing this throughout the, the economy. And that's why we saw massive GDP. So this is why I'm more optimistic, because there is, a, there is a solution, and it's a really simple one. And if you're a human capital professional, this is what you try to do every day. Right people, right skills, right place, right time, right motivation. Ask any CEO, and they will say, I want that. Please, can I have that? which drives this engagement, innovation, and productivity. So it's a very, very simple solution. Now, when you take that, and then you multiply it times some of this amazing technology, which, if Alexa would work, I could show you, but she's gone on strike. Um, but but uh, um, you know, devices like this, some of the emerging, very intelligent software, I take a very positive view, because I see companies and government starting to focus on this equation and marrying it up with technology. So let me explain in a little bit more detail some of the other things I see and why I'm optimistic um, that we're going to uh, find a way out of this issue. So the emerging workforce, I'm going to walk you through some of these things that I think are, are going to help dramatically. The emerging workforce is totally not what you think it is. So as I was saying earlier, right, so I'm going to give you some free financial advice which is don't plan on a pension that takes you to 70. You should be planning on a pension that takes you to 90, at least, right? Because lifespan is going to continue to accelerate in the length of, of time uh, that you'll not only be alive, but healthy, right? So if you plan on a pension to get you to 75, you're going to run out of money, and you're going to work at Walmart, OK? So this is why it's really important. Um, but this also drives then having six generations in work at once. And a number of economic studies done in 2016 show that another reason why productivity might pick up is because we have this amount of people from 16 to 60 to 70 in the workforce, right? And this is going to help to drive human productivity because we've got more talent. So very important, think about your pension. You should try to last beyond the 90th year. And in fact, the chief medical officer in the UK um, earlier, uh, late December published a study they did that said people who work into their 70s will live longer and have better, uh, better cognitive abilities. So not only is it um, potentially necessary to work to 70, it's actually good for you. Um, the key is, is to find things that you like to do, and we'll come back to that. So this is one of the key things. The other thing um, that we see is that over the next 25 years or so, by 2030, um, well, over the last 25 years, and then by 2030, we're going to actually see, it's predicted there'll be more women in work than men, just slightly more. And for me, my experience at IBM, which is a very feminine company, when I joined in 2010, my boss, Ginny Rometty, who's now the CEO of IBM, um, you know, throughout the company, it was full of very high-powered senior women. And it just had a very different feel. So I went from Accenture, which was very alpha male. Those of you from Accenture here, you know what I'm talking about. Very alpha male to IBM, which was much more feminine. And IBM very, very high-performing uh, company. And in fact, in, during the financial crisis, IBM hit its all-time best share price for a 100-year-old company, right? And part of it, in my experience, was, was the amount of women in work. And it's hard for me to explain exactly what it is, um, to put my finger on it. But essentially, what I found is you, you tend to get a more collaborative environment when you have senior women working uh, together with senior men and you just get more productivity. It's a very interesting uh, dynamic that you get in companies where you get senior women working together with senior men as well. So this is another reason why I'm very positive about the future. Another thing, so um, how many people have heard of autistic spectrum disorder? It's been redefined re uh, recently. There used to be a term called Asperger's, which has been done away with. So essentially, autism is now described as a spectrum from very mildly autistic to profoundly autistic. Now, 80% of the people with ASD are in the fully functioning, you probably wouldn't even know they have it, right? Autism. They seem maybe a bit oddball or whatever, but... Um, and what we found, and in, in SAP, and a number of companies in Silicon Valley are doing this at the moment, 
um, are starting to actively recruit people with autism. And the reason why, it isn't a charity thing, right? So in our company, by 2020, we're going to have 10% of our workforce is going to be on the autistic spectrum. And the reason why is because what's called different brains, this is where the innovators come from. So a friend of mine did a study, did a two-year study in Silicon Valley and studied the senior leadership of a lot of these big, very successful startup uh, companies. And he found that nearly 37, 36, 37 percent of the leaders of those companies were ASD. The population in general around the whole world is 1 percent. So you can see there's a, a vast difference. So there's a lot of companies like uh, SAP, IBM, others actively recruiting people um, to bring them in um, with ASD. Because people with ASD are very good at, you put them in a room, give them a task, and they will figure it out. And they come up with amazing different ways to do it. So let me tell you a story. I'm from Dayton, Ohio, which is where the Wright brothers were from. Everybody know who the Wright brothers were? Invented flight. Um, there was a study done in a book written recently about how could they, not knowing anything about engineering, not knowing anything about flight, solve the problem in three years. They went from knowing nothing to flying in three years. And when they looked at them and they looked at, at some things written about them, the um, biographers came to the conclusion that they were on the autistic spectrum. They couldn't get on in school. They didn't go to school. They read books, the things that interested them. They started a bicycle company, right? So they, they developed the right cycle, which was a very innovative um, uh, bicycle back in the day. When they got bored with that, which is what people with ASD do, they said, why don't we figure out how to fly? And they just started from scratch. They went to the Smithsonian in DC, they read everything they could find, and they came away with a, um, uh, an insight that nobody had figured out. The mechanics of flight, lift, and moving forward were solved. They came to that conclusion. That was not the issue. So they went down to North Carolina and spent six months on the beach observing birds, drawing pictures and running around like this on the beach, and the people thinking they were completely mad. But what they were figuring out was how to fly. It wasn't about the lift and the machine. It was they were learning how to fly. They came up with an innovation which solved the problem, which was they could have wings that tilt opposite, opposite twisting wings. That allowed them to control the plane, which is why they could fly. And it's fascinating that they learned that in three years. Nobody could solve that over hundreds of years, and they solved it in three. And it comes back to um, many of the researchers say they had, di they had a different brain. They came at the problem from a different angle. So it's very, very interesting to see how, um, how a lot of companies are starting to tie into that. So a lot of famous people you would know would today be categorized on this. It's Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, there's the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orv Orville. It's interesting, uh, Wilbur was the older one. He always got Orville to fly the plane. So I don't know how that worked out for him. He did crash once and nearly kill himself, but um, they were very close, those two. So just people who uh, are on that and were real innovators in their field, that's where they came from. So you want to tap into this kind of, um, uh, this kind of uh, people and these different brains. So the world for talent, as I said earlier, this is going to be really important. So it's a surplus of talent, not a scarcity. And the companies and organizations that are going to win are those that can get to grips with a really boring subject, but it's absolutely important, strategic workforce planning. It's going to become the competitive advantage. Coming back to what I said earlier, for those companies that can figure out who they're going to need, how many, and what types of skills 12, 18 months out are going to win. Because they can go target, find that surplus of talent, pull it in and use it. And it's very, very um, uh, powerful, and the companies that do it very well. So for instance, airlines are, have been for decades extremely good at this. It's very hard to make money in an airline. But the airlines that are, are able to get the right people in the right place at the right time with the right skills, they, they are profitable. Um, and so it's a, it's a very powerful, um, very powerful uh, concept. So another reason why I'm very um, positive about the future, because this is becoming more and more important. And in fact, a lot of universities are starting whole degree courses on strategic workforce planning. Might sound boring, but it's going to be very important in the future. So the machines are on the march. So um, this headline, the machines are taking over. I actually pulled that 
from a newspaper in 1743 in the Times, London. It said the machines are taking over. Everybody's going to lose their job. The machines are coming. So this has been a headline for a very, very long time. And what do you know? We're all still employed. Yeah, unemployment is a little bit higher than maybe we would like. But um, the machines have never taken over. We are still in charge. So how is that? How is that? So let me give you a story. A friend of mine, I don't know if you, if you have tried Uber, or sorry, uh, London taxi cab, right? Black cab? The thing about London taxi drivers you might not know is they spend four, three to four years learning every single street in London. And they learn the fastest way to get to that street. So if I go into a black cab, I say, can you take me to number four Jilts Crescent, which is my street in London? That taxi driver knows instantly where that is and what's the quickest route. Now, unfortunately for those taxi drivers, Waze does that now. Google Maps does that now. All these sat-nav do it. So Uber has taken over a lot of the London business, right? They don't need to know where any streets are. And so a friend of mine, his, um, a friend of mine, his uh, son, uh, studied to be a, a London cab driver. And, uh, of course, he went out and tried to make a living, uh, and he couldn't. So he quit and then joined a software firm to take the knowledge that he had learned, and now he's writing software for autonomous cars. So in about two or three years from now, when you come to London, you're going to be, uh, have an Uber car show up, and there's not going to be any driver in it, which is going to be kind of funny. But if you think if you're a black cab driver, this is not a good thing. So it is true. Some people lose their jobs in these kinds of disruptive changes. But in the case of my friend's son, he went and took that knowledge and, and took a different job. And that's what's happened over and over again. And that's why the machines never do completely take over. They do disrupt, but humans always find a different way um, to deal with it. The number one book, everybody uses it, everybody cites it, Harvard Business School uses it. This is the book that, if you're interested, will tell you and help you understand this concept much better than I can. Um, but it's, a, it, it's an important book in terms of understanding how the machines are going to uh, work or not work in the case of Alexa. Alexa, are you still there? Nope, she's given up. <laughs> People, data, and insights. So we talked about this already. Um, it, it's amazing, you know, just this one point, how many companies I go to and say, for instance, a company says, right, we're going to put 200 people in China to set up an offshore um, telephone uh, sales organization. How many people will say, well, we just did that based on a gut instinct? We didn't do any numbers. We just said it sounds good. It seems like it'll be cheaper. It'll be, it'll be faster. It's amazing how many, how many organizations do that. So this is the, the book I wrote just a few years ago um, called Calculating Success, which is seven uh, organizations that do uh, HR analytics really, really well. They do recruiting, learning. They measure these things and can, and can show return on investment, et cetera. So this is a really, really important thing. All the things that we've been talking about, you cannot solve, right? without data insights, as we've discussed. And lastly, this is the last piece as to why I'm really, really um, excited about the future. Again, more and more and more, these cloud technologies, which you don't need to be trained on, right? So when I use our HR system, I do my team's compensation. I do my team's learning plan. I, as the manager, am in charge, which is great, because it helps me to build a more productive team. And so these always-on cloud technologies, which are mobile-based, even down to the watch. So I've got an Apple watch. Uh, in Amazon, in the US, they give these to guys who are out in the warehouse. And this is how they find through the watch. That's how they find things to pick and pull out. Um, it's amazing and very powerful. So it's just like this. It's sort of Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these sorts of things. We need to bring that into, into the work environment. Digitizing HR is becoming very, very powerful. So as I said, this is the reason why I'm, I'm much more positive than OACD. Right people, right skills, right place, right time, right motivation, it is happening. People are going back to this as a core fundamental in terms of organizing around companies. When you multiply at times this amazing technology, I think we're going to see historic GDP growth uh, going forward into the future. So let's just quick, let's go through a few things that are changing and, and why, and then we'll wrap up. So, this is Daniel Pink's, um, I, and I've kind of just pulled a few screenshots. So Daniel Pink looked at the whole idea of extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic is you pay me money and I do something. Intrinsic is why do I wake up to come to work in the morning? 
And what he's found and what the studies have shown is when you get those two things in balance, you get a very high performing workforce. So let's look at investment bankers, right? In 2008, crashed the economy. People just kept paying them more and more and more cash bonus. They kept taking more and more risk. They became less productive and ultimately crashed a lot of the banks uh, in the world. That is the type of thing that we've been doing since the 1600s, 1700s, which is if you reward something, do you get more of the behavior you want? If you punish it, do you get less? Well, it turns out that's not how humans think. Unless you're doing basic work like producing widgets or working in a factory, fantastic, it works really well. But if you're doing knowledge work, which is most of us, the more cash bonus you pay somebody, the less their productivity, right? And it's very, very interesting. So he basically come up with the point that says, look, what we found in high-performing companies, right, the three factors that lead to better um, satisfaction, better personal performance, is by giving people the autonomy to do what they need to do, right? Give them the opportunity to build new skills, mastery. So like learning a guitar, why does anybody learn to play a guitar? Well, you get better at it. Mastery, and then purpose. And that last one, purpose, so if you think about Apple and those Apple stores, well, those guys in that store are totally buy into the Apple brand, the total buy into the technology. And you can look at Apple stores. They give them the autonomy to roam around the store. They give them the opportunity to learn about new technology. There's a purpose. Those companies are very, very high performing. So basically what Daniel Pink is saying, and I highly recommend this book, is the old way of reward and punish doesn't work. It creates risky behavior, low productivity. If you give people the autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and you get in balance cash rewards with why do you come into work, you get a much better outcome. Uh, and this is very, uh, very interesting. And this is why you see a lot of companies starting to change their performance management approach. So Accenture, Microsoft, SAP, moving to a kind of continual give you feedback and reducing these cash bonuses, right? Moving to, instead of paying cash bonuses, paying with shares or other kinds of benefits or new training or learning and trying to get that extrinsic cash balanced with the purpose of the organization. So a major change at the moment. Digital HR, as we said, it's always on, it's there. This is another thing that's coming along that's going to help dramatically. And in fact, this is what my HR system looks like in SAP. So it's very consumer-like. It's tiles, double click on, go in. I can very quickly do my team's learning plans or do their compensation. And it's all down to me to do that. And I can do it on my mobile, I can do it on my desktop, I can do it on my iPad. And again, this creates a lot more, but I'm closer to the productivity of my team. Um, and this is what makes for a, a higher, uh, higher productivity as well. And soon, this technology is going to be ubiquitous. I predict it, within the next three to five years, you won't hear the word HR system anymore. Because it's going to be like my, my wife's refrigerator. It's always on. It's always ordering the things that we need. And I don't need to do anything. I don't need to interact with it. And these things will come down to wearable devices, et cetera. So if you think about it, HR systems are going to become very much performance support systems going forward. And they'll be there all around you throughout your day. So I'm going to just sort of skip right ahead because we're running out of time to, to the very end and talk about learning. So take all of this now. We're landing the plane, right? 50,000 feet down to um, coming in for a landing. So the revolution in learning, it's very interesting. If you think 15 years ago, you all will remember this. Oh, universities are going to go away. We won't need universities anymore. We won't need education um, places anymore. And that's not true. That's not how it turned out at all. Um, and the reason is because technology has married up very nicely with the 1,000-year-old university. So let's use an example. This young girl here, so this is Thomas Friedman, right? Tom, Thomas is the uh, uh, he's a New York Times columnist and economist. And this is a young girl from Afghanistan who, being a woman or a girl, couldn't have access to education. But she did have access to a, to a PC. And it turns out she's a physics genius. And she logged on to Stanford University's distance learning programs and started to take these very advanced uh, physics courses. And in fact, she got noticed by the university and was eventually brought over on a full scholarship. But she did most of her physics studies in Afghanistan, in a room with a PC. And that just shows the power and the change of, of how technology has supported that. So she's now uh, finishing her doctorate. I think she's 16, 17-year-old now. 
um, finishing her doctorate, and she did most of it, right, in, from Afghanistan on a PC. So it's very, very different. The marrying up of universities and higher education with technology has turned out to be very powerful. It, it has not replaced, technology has not replaced those universities. In fact, it's empowered and created more effective universities. So when we look at, I mean, what is it that people um, are really um, uh, worried about these days? And this doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're new into the workforce or you're a baby boomer. More and more, people are less concerned about being unemployed, but more concerned about obsolescence. So do I have the skills that can be sold into an organization and I can get a job? So for, whether you're 16 or 60, it's becoming a lot more important to make sure that your skills are constantly updated, right? And so this is the thing that people worry about the most. They don't worry about being laid off. They worry about position changing or becoming obsolete, and what do they move on to the next thing? So my friend's son, he moved on to become a software engineer, right, before he became obsolete. So what's, what's it look like? What does the future look like? So the goal should be employee-driven, self-sustaining learning organizations where every employee is both a learner and a teacher. And this is when you've got a sustainable learning organization, when every employee is a lifelong student and a teacher. So in SAP and the IBMs of the world, they use their internal collaboration networks to constantly be sharing. So one person's expert in something, somebody else is driving the next, right? And this is a very, very important concept going forward. So if you're an employee and you're also a lifelong student, the importance is of the delivery, how it's delivered, continuous, more personal, specific to what you do, and then collaborative, the ability to share things. So very often in my team, people will take a video of a talk or a conference call or something and post that up on our networks and then share that with everybody so that other people can see it as well. So the revolution in learning is still in progress. So neuroscience, the way we understand the brain is gone leaps and bounds in the last 10 years, right? So this whole idea of understanding how different ways people learn from people who are autistic through to non-autistic, it's everywhere now. It's literally on from the watch to the PC, et cetera. Micro-learning, it's happening where and when, and it's very small bites of learning, and you all have seen that as well. And intelligent, so learning that actually knows, and if I could get, if I could get Alexa to work, she knows the sorts of things that I'm interested in, so she's become very intelligent in terms of what I like to learn. Self-publishing, back to that point, anybody can go on LinkedIn and write an article now, right? So you've got an idea, put it out there. Everyone can do that. Alternative credentialing, right? So you don't have to have a BA, an MBA, a PhD. There's different ways to credential people and to build um, uh, credentials and, and new, new job positions. And then finally, the flipped classroom, right? So the classroom and passive ways of learning are very important, but also having engaging ways of learning uh, using technology has changed as well. So these things, bringing this all together, the revolution in learning is still in progress. Universities didn't go away. They've actually been strengthened, and this is where we've landed. So just to give you an example, LinkedIn, this is a community I started six years ago, HCM Global Community, where people are constantly sharing what they know. And then inside SAP, this is, a, this is a page, we call it Planet HR, and this is where we share information and, and collaborate with each other. So we call it jamming. Um, so just like musicians jamming, this is what we do inside of SAP to share information. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to end there. I don't think we probably have time for questions, do we? Yeah? Yeah, we'll do, two, we'll do a couple minutes for questions. So let me stop there. Um, that's it for today. Any questions? Any questions out there? Well, I had a question. I put it on our app for you, if we can do a real quick question. Given that there's going to be six generations now in the workforce, you know, from baby boomers on to millennials and beyond, do you think we're going to struggle reconciling the sort of cultural and value differences there? Millennials have a very different value structure of sort of entitlement in some ways of, I want to make an impact with impatience and all these things, where I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, closer to your value system, and a lot of the times I'm like, you've only been here three months, you know, like, mm -hmm. come on. 
how could we maybe address that? Is that going to be something important? It seemed to me that will be from yeah. your speech. But. Yeah. No, I, absolutely. And I, I'm not going to pretend to have the answer to that. It's a pretty profound uh, issue, really. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. We did, a, we did a study in SAP two years ago that studied millennials and baby boomers. And, and in lots of ways, they're very similar, right? They're, they're very interested in you know, job security and, and, and moving up in the world and those sorts of things. But the ways in which they get there, they look very differently, right? And to your point about, you know, there's sometimes very uh, uh, high expectations about what's going to happen, you know, very, very early in career. And it's, it really takes those of us who've been around who have gray hair to kind of help people understand that, you know, there is a process. There is a journey. And it isn't about holding you down or holding you back. But you've got to have experience and have that ability to, um, to, to, to learn and thrive and that it takes time. So I spend a lot of time with a lot of the young people in my organization and coaching that, right? I think that's something that you can't just tell somebody. You have to show them going forward what's, the, um, uh, you know, what's, the, what's required to build up eminence and, and the ability to do new things. Thank you very much. OK. With that, we'd like to uh, thank Tim. He was our keynote speaker. I personally loved it. I thought it was great.